Today we're going to talk about how to wire a tool changer interlock so it's impossible to eject a tool while the spindle is spinning at 12,000 RPM. Because that would be a bad day. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. This is a part of my video series on installing a three horsepower ATC spindle on my Grizzly Geo 704 mill back here. We've already covered a lot of ground. We've got the electronics box assembled, wired and tested. We've got a mount machine, so we're ready to actually put the spindle on the mill. And today we're gonna to talk about the automatic tool changer wiring and the safety interlocks and emergency stop and other circuits associated with that. I have gotten a lot of questions about the ATC interlock in particular, and so I thought it would make sense to go ahead and cover that in a separate video. Honestly, I was expecting to wait and do this later after I had everything mounted on the mill, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized it's gonna be way easier to show all this stuff on the bench. Once it's on the mill, I'm gonna be crawling around in the dark with a flashlight in my teeth, and this will be a lot easier. Let me pause a moment here to talk about safety. Machine tools, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, can be dangerous. They've got powerful motors, they're driven by potentially lethal voltages, and they contain nearly 100% of their own weight in gravity. I'm gonna show you what I did with my tools in my shop, and I'm in no way telling you that you should do exactly the same thing with your tools in your shop. If you wanna work on your own machines, that's great. Just make sure you fully understand what you need to do to be safe, or find somebody qualified to help you. If you do decide to follow along, you're doing so at your own risk. So let's go over to the bench and take a look. Now this spindle has an automatic tool changer in it, which means we apply pneumatic power to it and it releases the tool and you can put a new tool in, release the pneumatic pressure and it sucks the tool in and locks it in place. So no messing around with wrenches or air tools on a drawbar. This has actually got two air ports on the back. These are quarter inch push to connect. Uh, this one is for case pressurization, and this one is for the drawbar. So you apply pressure here, it releases the tool, and in general, when it's running, you want to apply some air pressure to the purge port, and that flows air through the spindle and out around the nose bearing. And the whole point of that is just to keep debris from getting into the spindle. Provides a little bit of cooling. It's not strictly speaking necessary on this model. It's an optional feature. Uh, but it's there in case you're running abrasive materials. You want to make sure none of that gets back into the spindle nose bearings. Now to operate the drawbar, I'm going to use an electric pneumatic solenoid valve. And we've covered these in previous videos. And you saw me work through uh, dealing with a low quality set of valves that I got off of Amazon. These are higher quality. These come from Automation Direct. These are Nitra branded valves. And I opted for what are called 3-2 valves. So there's three ports and it's a two position valve, but there's only one output. So the way this was designed to be used, the manufacturer recommends a 5-3 valve uh, so that you it, it's double acting and has two ports. When the valve is on, it activates the drawbar. When the valve is off, it supplies the purge air. The problem there is there's no way to turn off the purge air, it's just gonna run continuously. So I wanna have separate valves. So I've got a valve for the automatic tool changer, a valve for the purge air so that I can turn that on and off independently. And then I have a third valve here for coolant. I wanna control my coolant. Uh, I'm gonna put it on a fog buster and I wanna control that separately with Mach 3. For the tool change for now, I'm not planning on doing an automatic tool changer. I'm going to do it manually with a foot pedal. And so this is just an electric switch foot pedal. There'll be a link down in the description. I picked this up off of Amazon. And normally there's just a cable gland that comes with it that screws into the back here, but I wanted to have a connector. And so I opted to use one of these GX16, uh, also called aviation connectors. Um, but in, of course there's no good way to mount it because the threaded hole in here for the cable gland is much bigger than the thread for the connector. So I just made a 3D printed adapter. This is just direct printed with the threads already in it. The outside thread here that screws into the cable gland hole is 14 threads per inch, it's a half inch pipe fitting. And the inside is uh, M16 by one that fits the GX16 connector. So I just run that into there, screw that down here and I got a nice easy connector mounted on the back of the pedal with no drama, get a nice neat, reliable installation. 
Now, to wire all this up, there's a couple of ways you could go. You could just go mount all this stuff on the mill and then start stringing wires and crawling around underneath it with a crimping tool and a soldering iron and a flashlight. And uh, I did not want to do that. So I went ahead and just measured and made wiring harnesses while sitting comfortably at my bench inside. So this has got the connectors for the valves. I'll go ahead and plug those in. ATC, coolant, purge air. And these have got little LEDs in them uh, from the manufacturer that uh, so you can tell which valves are turned on. Great for troubleshooting. And I've gone ahead and wired in diodes. I'll show those on a circuit diagram in a minute. Uh, reverse bias across the coils to absorb the transient when the coil shuts off. And then I'm using just these amp circular polarized connectors. Uh, these are great. They're crimp connectors so you can crimp everything down and then install them into the connector. Nice and neat. Same with the other side. They're also crimp connector inside the box. And then this is for the pedal. And I've pre-measured and so all these wires are the correct length. When I finally get around to putting this on the mill, I can just go put everything in its place and just hook up the wires. Uh, the, cable, the wiring I'm using here is um, uh, pretty nice stuff. I've been, this is what I use whenever I have a chance. This is uh, Belden 8451. And what it actually is, it's a microphone wire. It's intended for microphones in uh, permanent installations like in walls in, in large facilities. And it's got a complete foil jacket and a drain ground wire and then one pair of conductors. So it's a shielded balanced wire. So I went ahead and just hooked one of these up for each circuit, um, you know, one for each of the valves, one for the foot pedal, and then for the cable that goes over to the CNC controller, I did exactly the same thing. There's four circuits, four pair that go through there, and I've just run those in separate cables. They're all labeled, they all have independent grounds, and then of course the shield drain is only connected on one end because you don't want to create a ground loop. And then for the other end that's going to go into the box uh, over on the CNC controller, I went ahead and just pre-wired and pre-terminated the connector and I'll install this in the box later, but I wanted it here on the bench. So we got circuit for the coolant, for the e-stop, for the trip, and for the mod bus that we'll eventually be using to control the spindle. And so I'll just take this over and install it into that box and this just hooks up. But for now, the benefit of pre-terminating all these cables is I can set it up on the bench and we can do all the testing here in comfort without crawling around under the mill with a flashlight. Now I have already wired everything in this box. And you can see I've got this, I did the same thing that I did with the pre-terminated connection for the VFD, or excuse me, for the uh, CNC controller. And the connectors are pre-terminated with wires. These are all routed around and already hooked into the, uh, into the VFD. And then some of the wiring goes around for power supplies and relays and some other stuff that we will uh, discuss in a few minutes. Now one of the things that I do whenever I wire something like this, because I know how it works today, but I also know I'm not going to remember a year from now when I want to make changes. So everything is labeled. Uh, the red wires are positive, the black wires are ground, and everything else has got a, has a, has a label on it. You know, trip, therm, e-stop, SPSN for the Modbus, everything. And then everything is also terminated with a proper ferrule. So I've got a ferrule cramp, crimped onto the end of this so that I don't have any stray wires they are gonna short out or they're gonna wear out as I take it in and out over time if I have to make changes. And those are little crimp on ferrules that just go right on the ends of the wires. And I've, I've shown these in a previous video, but they're really nice and it bears repeating. So I've got my Nipex stripper here. These are wonderful, by the way. And I've got the link set for what I need for the ferrule. Just pop that off and then slide on one of the ferrules. And then I've got my ferrule crimper with the dies that will crush it down onto the wire. And it's that simple. And now I've got a very nice terminated connection that will last, you know, virtually forever. I can 
pull this in and out, I can abuse it and I don't have to worry about the wires fraying. In case it wasn't abundantly clear, the goal of the automatic tool changer inter interlock is to provide an easy way for me to press this pedal to release the tool, but to guarantee that no matter what I do, I cannot release the tool while the spindle is running. It's the last thing I want are tools flying out of the spindle because I made a simple mistake. So I wanna set this up so that even if I press this pedal while the spindle is running, it will just do nothing and it will not eject the tool until the spindle stops. So this is the circuit that I'm going to use. So what we've got here, I've represented the spindle control box and the variable frequency drive within that. Now the VFD has in it something that's called an alarm relay. And it's generally used for signaling when the, when the VFD has tripped, but you can reprogram it and use it for anything that you want. And I'm gonna program it to output whether the spindle is running or not. So what's shown here is the default position. When the spindle is not running, this is the default position of the switch. I've got a 24 volt power supply. The current can flow through, this is the normally closed contact, so when this is not energized, it can flow through to the pedal, and then the pedal switches the current to the tool change valve. So in this state, with the thing just sitting here off, if I press the, if I press the switch, it should trigger the tool change. But when it's running, I have this relay programmed in the VFD to energize when the VFD is running, and this will switch to the other side, and that will instead send the 24 volts directly to the purge air valve and turn it on. And since this switch is in the other position and there's no power being provided to the pedal, it doesn't matter. I can hit the pedal all day and nothing will happen. It won't actually uh, change the tool. So we've got this wired up this way to the connections in the VFD. Now let's look at the programming to do that. Okay, for the programming for the relay, we have to do two things. We have to set the polarity of the signal we want and we have to select the function that we actually want to output. So the alarm relay function is on C026. So I'll go to C026. And I have that set to 21. And according to the table of output functions, 21 is the zero hertz speed detection signal. And then the other thing that we have to do is we have to set the actual polarity or the active state. So the alarm relay active state is C036. So I'll go over to 36 and I have that set to 01, which is normally closed. So we have the output of the relay set to normally close. That gives us the polarity that we want to control the valves. And that should be all the setup that's actually needed. Let's give it a try, see if it works. Okay, so with the spindle not running, it's uh, turned off right now. With it not running, we should be able to activate the tool changer. So I press the pedal here and sure enough, you can see the light here turning on to say that that switch is being activated. And with it running, let me go ahead and start it. Run it nice and slow. Now the spindle is running and you can see that the purge air has switched on and now I press the pedal and we get absolutely nothing on the automatic tool changer. So I'm just gonna hold the pedal down and stop the spindle. You can hear it ramp down and then when it actually stops, the automatic tool changer valve opens. And if I hit run, it shuts off immediately. So that's exactly what I want. I want it to spin completely down to a stop and once it's come to rest, then the tool changer activates. Now, in general, I'm not gonna be holding the switch down while I stop the thing. I'm gonna be running it. We have purge air while it's running. It will stop, and then I'll walk over and press the button to activate the tool changer. And so this is great because anytime it's not running, um, and in fact, even if the VFD is powered down, the default state of the relay is to activate the tool changer. So as long as I've got air pressure and power, even if the VFD is physically turned off, I'll still be able to get tools in and out of the spindle. 
One thing I just realized I forgot to point out on this circuit diagram is this diode that is reverse biased. So because the positive side of the power supply is connected to this end, uh, the diode is reverse biased, so current will not normally flow through it. But whenever you have any kind of a coil, like a relay or a, an electromagnet on a valve that is energized, when you switch it off, the magnetic field collapses and it works like a generator and generates a negative voltage spike. And if you don't provide that current any place, that voltage any place to flow as a current, it will generate a very high voltage until it finds a place to break down and discharge. And so that can feed back into electronics and damage them. In this case, it's just a, uh, a physical switch. It can actually burn the contacts on those switches over time or feed back and cause issues in the power supply. This power supply is pretty robust. But in general, it is good practice to reverse bias a diode across any coil to absorb that uh, surge when it shuts off. And I actually have that diode installed inside the connector right at the valve. Okay, the next circuit I wanna talk about is the coolant control. This one is actually really simple. We just have a 24 volt power supply hooked up to the valve for the coolant and we have a switch. But instead of that switch being manual, I've got that fed across into the CNC control box and my breakout board has a relay on it and I just have those wires connected up to the relay. Now there's no common ground between these, there's no logic signal or anything, I just have a pair of wires going across to the breakout board so that the relay can close to activate the coolant. Now my breakout board's only got one relay on it but lots of uh, CNC controllers have got lots of different relay outputs. So I'm just gonna use the one that I have for coolant because I plan to eventually control the spindle itself with Modbus. And so I have this hooked up. Uh, this is the wiring harness that's gonna go into the CNC box and I've just got a pair of wires here hanging out with that are labeled for the coolant switch and I will just touch these together to simulate closing that relay. And you can see the coolant LED is coming on. So that is successfully tested. That is activating the coolant valve. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is the emergency stop system. Uh, and this is arguably the most important part of any CNC or any machine installation. I want to have a big red button that I can smack that will shut down everything. So if something is going wrong, I want one place that I can hit that will stop the entire system. And that means I wanna stop the spindle from running and I also wanna stop the CNC machine from moving. All motion needs to stop instantly. Uh, so that you know, if something goes wrong, I break a tool, a spindle shuts down, you know, whatever happens that is going wrong, the cut's sounding bad before damage is done, I can smack that button and stop and then sort everything out. But because I've got two things going on here, I've got Mach 3 running the CNC motors actually moving the mill, and I've got the spindle, in this case of controlled by a VFD in a separate enclosure, but even if I had it all in the same box, uh, th you've got a problem here in being able to shut down both. Now, I could just put the spindle under control of Mach 3 and trust that when I hit the big red button, Mach 3 will reset and it will send the signal to the spindle to stop it. And, you know, that's fine. And for CNC control, I have no problem with using a system like that. But for an emergency stop, I do not feel good at all about trusting that kind of system because the kinds of things that go wrong are cables getting disconnected, um, things breaking, or just things that I did not anticipate going wrong. So the last thing I wanna do is trust that the data connection and the computer are gonna be functioning properly. I want a, an absolute simple switch that I can smack that will shut down the electronics without having to trust the software to deal with it. So I already have that on the CNC, but it doesn't include the spindle. So this is what I've got today in the CNC control box. I've got my breakout board and it's configured uh, with an e-stop input. And this goes through my, um, uh, my smooth stepper motion controller. I think it's important to say here that different people have different opinions of what an emergency stop system should do. Some people feel very strongly that the e-stop button should disconnect primary power from the machine completely. I'm not doing that here, but there might be very good reasons to do that on your machine or even regulations that require it in your industry. Though, 
if you're doing this at work based on a video you found on the internet, it might be time to sit down and reevaluate your decision making paradigm. So I've got the e-stop switch. It's normally closed for all safety systems on, on CNC machines. Normally closed circuits are important. You could configure this with normally open, so the switch is open, and when I hit the emergency stop switch, it closes the circuit and tells the system to shut down. But then what happens if I break a wire? If a wire breaks someplace, then I won't know it, and then when I go and hit the switch, it just won't work. So these are normally wired, normally closed. So the current can flow through the switch, that's condition normal, everything running, and then when you smack the switch, that opens up and signals the emergency stop. That way, if a wire breaks someplace, it'll also open the circuit and signal emergency stop. You'll fail safe and you'll know that something is wrong and you can fix it. Uh, the VFD also has a trip input that can shut it down and it's actually already wired up to the thermal cutout that is in the spindle. The spindle has a thermal switch and if the spindle overheats, this thermal cutout opens up and stops the VFD. But I also want to wire this e-stop switch to stop the VFD as well. So this is relatively simple. If you have an e-stop switch that has a stacked pair of switches. Now in this case, let's see, can I get this off easily? Normally these e-stop switches come with one switch on them, but you can stack switches as many as you want on here, as many as you have room for. And so I've stacked a second switch onto here so that instead of this being a single pole, single throw switch, it is now a double pole, single throw switch. It's actually double pole, double throw, but I'm not using the normally open side. So now my e-stop switch, I have that second switch wired into the circuit with the thermal cutout. And because this is a normally closed circuit, current can flow all the way through. And when I smack the e-stop switch on the mill, it opens up the circuit that shuts down Mach 3, and it also opens up the circuit that will shut down the spindle. So that will trip both with one switch. And I've just got a switch wired up here on the bench to simulate that circuit going over through the harness that's gonna be in the CNC controller. Now this solves part of the problem. This gives me a manual override that allows me to stop both. But the VFD also has a bunch of things that can cause it to trip. The VFD itself can see overcurrent conditions or under voltage conditions or load problems. And then of course there's the thermal cutout here. So if I'm milling along and the spindle overheats, this thermal cutout opens up and the spindle shuts down, well Mach 3 isn't gonna know. This is a completely separate circuit. And so we need some way to feed that information back to Mach 3 and let it know that something has gone wrong with the spindle. So if, you know, if the spindle overheats and just stops, we don't want Mach 3 to continue trying to plow the tool that's now no longer turning through the workpiece. So we need to be able to feed the trip condition from the VFD back. And that's not just a matter of the e-stop switch, so, even, so there's not any real nice, clever stuff we can do here. Um, we actually need to get an output from the VFD indicating its state wired into the e-stop circuit for the breakout board. So that is what I have shown here. Now the VFD has a number of outputs. One of the outputs is the alarm relay that we already talked about that we're using to run the purge air and the automatic tool changer valves. So that's no longer available. It also has two other logic outputs that are intended to hook up to uh, PLCs or other kinds of industrial control circuits. So there's a common circuit, in this case it's the common terminal, CM2, and then there's two output terminals, 11 and 12. And they're what are called open collector outputs, which basically means there's a transistor that will connect those two when in order to output a signal. You can program what these are gonna be used for. So I'm gonna program output 11 to be the trip out. So if the VFD trips, it will output a signal saying that it's tripped. And just like with the e-stop, this will be normally closed. So when conditions are normal, this switch will be closed. Now I don't wanna have a common ground between the CNC controller and the VFD. I don't wanna mess with that. I don't wanna mess with noise issues that can be caused by that. Obviously, when we hook up the Modbus, there is sort of a pseudo common ground, even though it's not connected. 
and that'll be fine because these systems are grounded in the same building, so it won't be a problem. But I don't want to connect the logic grounds unnecessarily and just invite problems. Now, technically, this is floating, but I didn't really want to trust that this common terminal was floating and could handle any kind of voltage difference and would reject noise. And I also, because this is not just a simple transistor in here, there's also a bridge rectifier in front of it, so you end up with like at least three diode drops across this. I didn't want to trust that this was going to reliably trigger anything on the other side, so I went ahead and set this up to drive a relay. So I've got the 24 volt power supply wired through an actual relay that I have in the uh, control box here so that normally when the VFD is not tripped, this trip out is on, the relay is energized, and this switch, which is normally open, would then be closed. So the relay during normal conditions would be closed, and I've just wired that into series into the e-stop circuit in the CNC control box. So just like I wired this switch in series with the thermal cutout trip circuit to trigger the VFD, I have wired this relay in series so that I can trip the breakout board and stop Mach 3. So no matter what happens, if the spindle shuts down or trips, it will open this circuit, which will open this relay, which will break the e-stop circuit and stop Mach 3. Now, because this is all normally closed, if the VFD simply powers down and is no longer in control, this will also open. And so if the VFD loses power completely and is unable to communicate, this will still open, it's still a fail safe, and it will still stop um, the, the, uh, the CNC machine from moving, which is exactly what we want. So let's set up to test this. And so really what we're trying to test is this pair of wires coming up to the CNC machine, are they connected? or are they not connected? And so I will just hook up a, I have those wires coming out here. Gotta find the right pair. There they are, and I will just connect these up to my multimeter. So I've just got continuity beep on this, so when these are connected, it beeps. And I will connect these up across these terminals. And you can see we have everything powered down. The VFD is not powered on, and so because it is not powered up, all of this should be open, and in fact it is open. We have no continuity. So in this situation, the CNC machine would be tripped and would not allow uh, any movement. So let me power this up. And with the system powered up, we are showing continuity and we have the annoying beep and looking on the control panel, our alarm is off. Now if we induce the VFD into an alarm condition, and I'll do that with the e-stop switch, then we immediately get an error code. The VFD has gone into an alarm condition and in fact, we now uh, OL overload and the beep is stopped because that circuit has opened. And so if we reset the e-stop switch and then we reset the VFD, that should reconnect telling us we're back in a normal state. And it does. And now we can run. And then if at any point while we're running, I smack the e-stop switch, the v VFD stops, the spindle stops, and we've opened the circuit, and that will stop Mach 3 and the CNC mill. Now, the programming required to make this happen is very similar to what we did before. We essentially have to make sure that we have the trip wired to an input. In this case, I've got that on input 3. We have to set input 3 to the trip and set it to a normally closed circuit. And then we have to set the output, in this case output 11, to the trip output and set that also to normally closed circuit. So the input function for number three is C003. C003 and that is set to 12 and 12 is the external trip. So uh, input number three is set to external trip, which is what we want for the e-stop. Then we need to make sure that's set to normally closed, and that is C013. 
and it's set to zero one, which is normally closed. Then we have to set the output, and output 11 is C021. Didn't need to press that. C021. And I have that set to five, and five is the alarm signal. So output number 11 is set to the alarm signal, and then we also need to set that to normally closed, and that is C036. Excuse me, 31. And that's set to zero 01, which is normally closed. And so that is it. Run and E stop. Beautiful. And not just beautiful, but safe. This is the type of relay that I'm using here. This is just a 24 volt single pull double throw relay. Uh, this one's a Clemson and I picked this up from Automation Direct. These are not very expensive. Now the actual relay itself is just this and it's just a little PC board mount uh, 24 volt relay. But it goes into this larger DIN rail mount that will snap onto a DIN rail and then provide screw terminals for the coil here, A1 and A2, and then common normally open and normally closed outputs for the switch side of the relay. And this will just snap right onto a DIN rail and you can mount a very large number of these in a box. And I just found a spot on the end of the DIN rail next to the filter here and dropped that in. And I was able to squeeze in one more power terminal down here so I could have another 24 volt output to drive it. And that worked out uh, just fine. It was able to get squeeze that in without having to do anything crazy with the box layout. Just a quick note about the low voltage wiring. Um, I've got the connectors up here and all of this low voltage wiring is routed around the side up here at the top of the box and into the terminals on the VFD. And these two wires right here coming in from the motor cable are also uh, up high in the box and then they come around and go down to the 24 volt wiring down here. And I've done everything I can to keep this low voltage wiring separate from the high voltage wiring, the input phases and the output phases, which are down a couple inches deeper into the box. The idea being that the further this stuff can be away from the high power circuits, the less trouble we'll have with noise and interference. Now, obviously these wires are going into the same cable that contains the motor phases, but, and there's nothing I can do about that because they have to go to the spindle, but everything else I've been able to keep separate. I need to get a few more wire ties on here to hold this all in place nicely. But uh, that actually worked out pretty well, being able to come around the side of the box and not have to drop in over here where the major power is. And uh, this is the trip circuit, and I prefer not to have it right next to the filter, but I didn't really have another convenient place to mount it. So I've tried to keep it as separate as I can, and uh, I think this is going to be fine. I think that's it for the wiring and programming. I'm not going to mess around with any of the Modbus right now. We'll run the mill manually. Um, I think what I need to do next is spend a bunch of time drilling holes to mount this. You need to drill, got to drill a hole and wire up the CNC box. And I've got to mount this physically on the mill. And I am going to do all of that stuff off camera. You don't need to watch me spend two hours routing wires and connecting everything and making sure it's all labeled to my satisfaction. You just want to see this thing make chips. And we will get to that very soon. If you're enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.